Hello, and welcome back to our video mini-series about manners and etiquette in 12th century England. My name's Philip, and today we're going to be talking about day-to-day -day manners and mannerisms. Essentially, how you would expect to see someone behaving on a daily basis. We're going to be talking about specific examples, as well as general scenarios today. So, it is probably best for us to begin with the most general thing we can. Standing, walking, and sitting. Now, I know what you're thinking, how different can it be? You know how to do all these things. But the difference between the modern world and the medieval world can be subtle, yet striking. See, a lot of how we behave, especially how we move, is unconscious, it's muscle memory. Yet, these things are informed by the world we live in, the clothes we're wearing, or what feels most comfortable to us in a modern context. Translate that to the medieval world, and these idiosyncrasies can appear anachronistic. Let's take a look at some examples. Standing still probably sounds like the simplest thing in the world. A modern person may put their hands in their pockets, slouch a little, lean their weight on one of their legs or shift back and forth, maybe pull their phone out of their pocket and idly scroll through the news feed. That's what's comfortable, but that's only comfortable because you've got pockets to lean on, you lightweight clothing that hangs from your waist, supportive shoes that cushion your feet when your weight is on them, and literal years of practice standing in this very way. For the Normans, this is clearly not the case, and this is reflected in their posture. By looking at manuscript images, paintings, and statues, we get a clear view of how people would stand in the 12th century. Head up, shoulders back, back straight, and feet shoulder width apart. Now this may sound familiar to you if you've ever done any kind of stage work or formal events. As you'll probably notice throughout this video, a lot of what nowadays is considered the <laughs> proper way to do things is actually just the old fashioned way. And a lot of this can be traced right back to the 12th century. Think about being ladylike. In the 12th century, this is entirely literal. You want to behave in the manner of a lady at court. Anyway, back to standing. What to do with your hands if you don't have pockets? Well, if you have a sword, you can adopt the classic look at my sword stance. And if you wear a cloak, you ought to hold it, either by your side or you can gather it all and fold it over your arm for your own convenience. Women are often depicted holding onto their cloak fastenings. Whether or not you have a cloak or a sword, you can always leave your hands gently crossed in front of your stomach, or rest your thumbs on the top of your belt. Fidgeting, however, was generally frowned upon. From standing, walking comes next. To be honest, once you're comfortable with your posture, it'll translate naturally into the way you walk. The most important things are to keep your head up, your eyes forward, and your tread light. Now, I refuse to get into the heel-toe or toe-heel debate, because it is largely irrelevant. What's important is that you are not stomping or throwing your weight down with every step that you take. This becomes harder when you're wearing armour, but you'll find that by keeping your shoulders back, you adopt a sort of swagger that is comfortable and stops you throwing your weight down onto your ankles as you move. Now, it was considered something of a scandal should a woman be walking around unaccompanied, and as such, women of marriageable age would often walk together and hold hands. If not with another woman, ladies could also be accompanied by a male family member or a member of the church, who were generally considered trustworthy enough to be scandal-proof. Hmm. In these cases, hands were overlaid in a more formal style. And when it comes to sitting, again, we need to move away from the modern convention of leading with your body weight and sort of plopping yourself down into a seat. Instead, you would bend at the knees while keeping your back straight in order to lower yourself gently. Cloaks would be gathered up before sitting and folded onto your lap, and feet would be crossed, as this is incredibly common in images of the time. Now let's move on to something a bit more distinctly medieval bowing and genuflecting. First, the difference between kneeling and genuflecting. 
Kneeling is where you have both of your knees down on the ground, and it is generally reserved for prayer. Genuflecting, however, is a formal demonstration. It's a series of actions that are used to show deference. Here's how you do it. First, with your right hand, remove your hat, if you're a man, and bring your right hand to your chest. As you step forward with your right foot, allow your left to trail behind and lower yourself onto your left knee. Whilst doing this, extend your left arm outwards, or if you're wearing a sword, you can use your left hand against the pommel to stop it from tripping you. If you do look down while genuflecting, make sure you look back up at whoever you are genuflecting towards. I'll explain this a bit more in a moment. Bowing is less formal than genuflect, but not by much. It's another public display and so follows a certain form. Now, modern bows and curtsies in Western Europe uh, evolved alongside changes in male and female clothing. But by looking at Restoration era theatre traditions and earlier sources, we can see the roots of the modern bow in the medieval form. First, it is very important to note though that bowing is the same for men and women in the 12th century. Curtsies did not exist. They evolved alongside hooped dresses, and so a Norman woman would bow in exactly the same way as a Norman man. Here's how you do it. With the right foot pointed outward, bring the left leg forward and point the toe. Remove the hat with the right hand, if you're a man, and bring the right hand to the chest. Sweep the left arm outwards. Now for the tough part. Whilst keeping the back as straight as possible, bend forward slightly at the waist. Simultaneously, bend the right knee so as to lower your body. Though you may bow your head as you do this, make sure you look back up at who you are bowing to. So, before we go any further, I need to discuss eye contact. See, nowadays you might think that in order to show respect or deference, you need to avert your eyes or look at the ground and keep your head bowed. And this is actually completely at odds to 12th century Norman worldview. See, they believed that you couldn't lie to someone while looking them in the eyes, and therefore avoiding eye contact when you spoke was tantamount to admitting yourself as untrustworthy, saying that nothing that you just said could be taken as the truth. Now, some of this belief has survived to the modern day. You may still tell someone to look me in the eyes and say that. Or you might ask someone to look at you in the eyes when they're making a claim, and if they could do so, you'll take it on faith that they're telling the truth. Now this informs a lot of the behaviour that we're about to discuss, but it basically means that modern people like you and I are going to have to work on getting past the convention of not maintaining constant eye contact while having a conversation. Right, now that we've got that out of the way, let's deal with something a bit more practical talking to someone. Now, when you meet someone, the first thing you're going to want to do is greet them. An informal greeting should take just about as long as it takes to remove your hat from your head, if you're a man, and nod. Now, hello is far too modern a greeting. But because of that, a lot of people tend to fall back on sort of pseudo-medieval anachronisms like a good morrow to the neighbour. No. A more authentic greeting would be a God save you or God keep you. They mention God a lot, you'll just have to get used to it. Now, that can be enough for two people who don't really want to stop and talk to each other and are of the same kind of social ranking. Essentially, it's the bare minimum. But let's build on it. Now, titles are nice and all, but if you know someone's authentic name, use it. If you're not sure of their name, you can use their trade. But if you don't know that, you can call them Freeman. Now, since a lot of our shows are military in nature, you may know someone's military rank, in which case you can refer to them as such. However, don't just make something up, and especially don't just use Sir as a sort of filler word for man. A sir has a specific meaning, it's a title afforded to knights. With that in mind, if you are speaking to a knight, use Sir and their name, for example, Sir Thomas. If you're not sure of their name, you can use Sir Knight. And if you're not sure if they're a knight or not, but they look like they could be, 
say they're wearing a sword or some fancy clothes, it's better to treat them as a knight. See, it's better to risk embarrassing a sergeant than it is insulting a knight. In fact, this is a good rule in general. Always aim high. It's always uh, the better scenario to be too respectful than it is to be considered disrespectful. Now, when it comes to magnates, things get a little bit more complicated, but not by much. If you're referring to a magnate who isn't present, you may use Lord and their name. For example, Lord Aubrey de Luc or Lord Aubrey. If you're referring to someone who is a, maybe a baron by their rank, then you use the baron and then the seat of their barony. For example, the Baron Lancaster. Note that it's not the Baron of Lancaster, just Baron and their seat. Alternatively, if they have a specific title, such as steward or warden, feel free to use that. Now, when you're speaking directly to a magnate, things change a little bit. You start adding my, for example, my lady. In these cases, it's not always necessary to add their name, since if you're speaking directly to them, it should be clear who you mean. When it comes to titles, those of women are a little bit different, as they were unlikely to be holding military rank, and very few women had a profession in their own right. As such, unmarried women would be referred to sometimes as a damsel or my damsel, that being a direct translation from the French mademoiselle, but they could also be maiden or maid. Now, it's worth noting there was no Mrs. or Mr., though words like mistress and mister do appear, they have specific meanings, they're not just filler words for men and women. It's also worth noting that members of the church have lots of very specific titles that refer to all the different jobs that they might do, but luckily, pretty much any church member will be more than happy to spend a long time explaining precisely what their title means to you, so don't worry about that. When it comes to formal greetings, this is where you would bow and use full names and titles. There are also some situations which would require a genuflect. Bringing someone of higher social rank a message or a gift would require a genuflect, as would receiving a gift from someone of a higher social rank. Making a formal request of someone and appearing before a court are two situations where you ought to genuflect regardless of rank. Another situation where you need to genuflect is when formally surrendering. Granted, this one only really applies to knights and magnates, but the act of offering up your sword should always be accompanied by a genuflect. Essentially, a genuflect is a way to recognise the formality of an act. Now, when it comes to taking your leave of someone, there is again a courteous way to do this. In formal situations, another bow is called for. Just make sure you step backwards first, so as to have enough room to bow properly. In a less formal situation, a step backwards and a quick bow of the head is enough. This should be accompanied by, God be with you, from which we get the word goodbye, or God bless you, another God keep you, or simply farewell. What's important about leaving someone is the step backwards. This may seem odd to us, but turning your back to someone was considered very disrespectful, or even downright insulting. And so, the step back is sort of like an official disengagement from the conversation, allowing you to then turn and take your leave without being rude. Phew, that was quite a lot to get through, so thanks for staying with me. Again, I want to say that if you're not following the advice from this video, don't think that you're doing something wrong especially as mannerisms are things that need to be practiced. I will say though that if you do practice and stick at it, these can really help you uh, inhabit your character more fully. All these idiosyncrasies of the medieval world can really make reenactment much more fulfilling. So I would say to finish off that the most important things to remember are how and who to bow to, and also that eye contact that we mentioned. And this can probably be the hardest one at a show, Often we want to be uh, turning to face the audience all the time so that they can see and hear us more clearly. And that is the right thing to do. But with a bit of practice, I think you can find a balance that really helps make these set pieces really come to life. So, that's all for this episode. Thank you very much for joining me. Next episode, we will be looking at table manners, really diving deep into the kind of nitty gritty of medieval etiquette. 
So, I hope to see you there. Farewell. <laughs>